feel it in the atmosphere. Oh, yes, the presence of the Lord is here. Yeah. Presence of the Lord is here. How about this? The justice of the Lord is here. <laughs> hey, the justice of the Lord is here. Powerful ministers, singers, Prophets and preachers living in a wasteland of don't ask, don't tell. Particularly if they choose to stay connected in an atmosphere of homophobia and homo hatred. And the fact that we don't tell, even when we're asked, doesn't change our reality. It just makes us compromise our integrity. We are a people who have done a lot of praying and a lot of crying. And a lot of asking God, if you want it changed, take it away. And to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and be the same you that you were last night when you went to bed. Hi, welcome to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host for the show. And yes, that clip that you just saw was a part of our show today, as we'll explain. There was an extraordinary gathering in January of 2006 in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, of people from uh, black churches around the country gathered together by the National Black Justice Coalition to talk about homophobia and the black churches and the way the right wing has been exploiting their move against gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people in the black churches and using the churches, at least that would be my opinion, uh, to try to further their agenda. So our guest today is Dr. Sylvia Rue. I want to get her title exactly right. Dr. Sylvia Rue, Director of Religious Affairs and Constituency Development for the National Black Justice Coalition. Welcome, Sylvia. Happy to have you here. Thank you. I think uh, before we talk about the conference, I'd like to know a little bit more about you, kind of what brought you to this uh, point in your life and working with the coalition. Uh, when did you start working on issues that were of interest to the LGBT community, and what was that work? I think I've always been somewhat of an activist, period. I started out with um, being part of Martin Luther King's Welcoming Committee to Los Angeles in 1964. And uh, I was, I, I demonstrated against the Vietnam War, but I think I became a, sort of a, an official activist when I got a job as the Assistant Director of Counseling at the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, and I've been an activist ever since. Uh, but your activism took you in areas where you were working in the area of religion. Uh, when did that happen? When that happened, uh, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, Dr. D. Mossbacker had done a film called Straight from the Heart uh, to challenge homophobia uh, because the religious right was getting a lot of videos together and taking them around to churches that were really breaking the Ninth Commandment, bearing false witness against gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered people. And D. Mossbacker, who was actually a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, had done a few slideshows and videos to challenge homophobia in medical settings to help doctors deal with gay and lesbian patients, to help patients deal with gay and lesbian doctors, and to help staff deal with gay and lesbian patients and doctors. And so when she saw that this video had come out, she said uh, she was going to do her own video. It was called Straight from the Heart. And her first time on, she got nominated for an Academy Award. But then, and she was on the board of the task force at that time, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And the head of the task force said, okay, now that you've done one for white churches, you need to do one for black churches. And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, Dr., I mean, Reverend Deborah Johnson, who was on the board at the same time, said, well, you need to meet Sylvia Rue. So Dee and I met, and this is over 10 years ago, actually. And we became co-producers along with Francis Reed. And we went out to uh, film African-American clergy and leaders and families to talk about homophobia in the black church and among in the black community. Now, what we knew was if we couldn't get black clergy to sign on, that we weren't going to have a film. And the doors just opened. It was really divinely led because everyone 
basically said, I'd really love to do this. And we got you know, Jesse Jackson, Maxine Waters, Cornell West, Reverend Cecil Chip Murray, uh, just, you know, um, some of the real, uh, Senator Carol Mosley Brown, some of the real leaders and movers and shakers of the African American community that we knew it was geared towards church folk. And we said, these are the people our parents respect and our colleagues respect. So I tried to get as many of them in there and it worked out pretty good. Now, why did Deborah Johnson say you've got to talk to Sylvia Rue? What was your connection? Deborah and I have known each other since she was 17, and she's a minister, and she knew that I had that I did videos, and she knew that I had actually gone to a Bible college, and that I would probably know how to put it, help to put it together, and be a good producer. So, what happened after the film was made, and what happened to you? After the film was made, we got uh, many, many awards, um, Lambda Legal gave us an award. Um, we got awards in the black community. And then actually what happened, and this sort of answers your question, uh, I, in taking all God's children around uh, the country, so many people came up and said, they were crying during seeing it, came up and said how oh, this had changed their lives. People said, now I can go home for Christmas and Thanksgiving. And so I decided to write a book about my experiences taking all God's children around. I had written the chapter on religion, and then I said, you know, I still don't know enough. So what I did was I immersed myself self in religious studies and became a religious scholar. So how did that lead then to your current job? Well, because I then not only had done all God's children, had uh, studied to be a religious scholar, but not with a degree, but, um, you know, self-taught. I mean, just, you know, I'm reading... Uh, I said to my friend, you mean people don't sit around Saturday night at home and read all this stuff? So um, in a, then I, I, I worked with Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, and I'd put on um, workshops for the black church and human sexuality, and plus, you know, I had a doctorate in human sexuality. So uh, by the time it came for me to know about this job that I have now, the Director of Religious, religious Affairs, I had had probably enough... Uh, education under my belt, experience to be accepted to do the job. Now tell us a little bit about the National Black Justice Coalition. How did that get started? In December of 2003, um, a lot of African American activists were getting concerned about the religious right, basically making inroads, uh, even invading black churches, and sometimes I, I call it giving money to black churches so they would get on board with the uh, anti-gay agenda. And that was an, a red flag, to say the least. And Keith Boykin uh, decided that there needed to be a national response to this and a national organization. So in December of 2003, he, he formed the uh, National uh, Black Justice Coalition. And ever since then, it's been growing and just really kind of taken off. and. We're the co-ed national voice of LGBT people who are African-American dealing with civil rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people. Now, there's been quite a history uh, going over years, really, of people doing work at the intersections between uh, gay and lesbian issues and black issues. Uh, I'm familiar, of course, with the work of Phil Wilson because he's a local Los Angeles guy. But would you say that this current work is kind of a, one of the culminations of a struggling tradition or a history of work that's gone on uh, in these intersections? Absolutely. I think struggling tradition is a really good way of putting it. Um, the thing about African American people that even if they don't go to church, they're churched and that they're influenced by either their family or their upbringing in terms of their religious be beliefs and they're overwhelmingly Christian and a lot um, one of the problems we have is a literal interpretation of some biblical text where we see the, um, the some of the problems come from because it's not what we would call, um, some people say it's not a rabbinical uh, reading of text where you, uh, I don't want to get into, um, you know. It's okay, you can. Well, it's like, anyway, there, there are certain ways of reading certain Bibles because there's not just one Bible. In fact, I happen to have a Bible that's called the Holy Bible, but it's a translation from the from the original Aramaic, which we know is one of the languages Christ spoke. And in that Bible, and it's called the from the Peshitta text, 
is translated by uh, George Lamza. And in Matthew of that, Christ actually does condemn homophobia. And most people don't have that translation. You can order it. It's not that obscure, really. And, uh, you know, in, the, let's say, the King James Version, or all the, most of the Bibles that we get our hands on, Christ is silent on the issue of homosexuality. But in, in the Peshitta text, the original Aramaic, Christ is actually condemning people of hell who are homophobic and call people effeminate or abnormal. He seemed to be against all kinds of discrimination, as we remember. That we seems remember to be sort of the Magdalene. point, doesn't it? Yeah, you would think so. <laughs> In terms of the National Black Justice Coalition, uh, how did they decide to bring together this conference in Atlanta? The National Black Justice Coalition had actually decided that before they hired me, in, in a way it's sort of one of the reasons they did hire me, because they wanted the conference to happen. Uh, our CEO, Alexander Robinson, and uh, Ray Carey from the, from the uh, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force wrote a proposal and uh, said this is what we want to do. So that it was sort of somewhat formed in, in uh, written form when I came on, but they had decided that this was something that really needed to be done. In fact, it was the idea, the brainchild of a man named Juan Battle, who's an activist in New York, who was on a plane one day and he said, we need to have a conference of black clergy, progressive clergy, who can all come together from all over the United States and talk about challenging homophobia in the black community and uh, working on marriage protections and um, getting, getting the word out there. There's not just one way to be Christian and that being uh, a conservative Christian is one way of being, about being progressive and including people and actually, actually working for justice for everyone is another way of being Christian or a person of faith. So were you then tasked with pulling this conference together? Yes, I created a, or I put together a religious advisory committee and they are the best group I've ever worked with. I mean, they're just, just really mainly clergy, African-American and white, uh, who are from uh, major organizations that we all got together and we said, let's do this. And we worked on it for about five months and pulled it together. And then did you issue invitations to specific people to present? To present, yes. But I also, uh, it was really sort of a clergy-driven conference. We, our goal was to get at least 40, and we reached that goal. We thought we'd have 75 people all together, 40 clergy, and then maybe 25 other people who were seminarians or lay people very much involved in this work and some observers. What happened was the response to this, once I'd sent out invitations to clergy, the response was so great that I had to shut down registration. Wow. It's wonderful. Yeah, it was great. So tell us now a little bit about this conference. Uh, we had a clip from one of the speeches at the beginning, but I, I'd like to get sort of a full idea about the conference, how it went, how people felt about it, what happened. The conference, one of the best things about the conference was, was it a mainstream, mainstream prominent African-American church. It was the first Iconium Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, with the Reverend Timothy McDonald as the senior pastor. Now, I must tell you, it was very brave of him to do that because they got a lot of hate mail and emails that were very, very disconcerting. And But they went through with it because Timothy McDonald is a decent, beautiful, brave man. And he said, we are going to do this in my church. So there was no, like, oh, I don't think we can do this. This is like, no, we're going to go ahead and do this because it's a learning opportunity. So we had the, um, we, we found the church, and we picked Atlanta because it was during King Week, and the theme of it was creating a more beloved community mm -hmm. because Dr. King talked about creating a beloved community. We also picked it because it was the center of an unfortunate incident uh, about a year ago with the uh, Bishop Lee Long and his uh, church and one of his associate pastors, the well-known Bernice King, the daughter of Martin Luther King, who actually led a march against justice under the guise of it being for justice, but it was against marriage rights for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered people. So that was a shameful moment, I think, on their part. So I personally wrote them a letter of invitation asking them to come to the conference. We did get feedback that Bishop Long said that he had other plans. I didn't hear from Bernice King at all. 
And we also, we, we, the, the, I said, you know, the prophet Isaiah says, come, let us reason together. And so we sent out uh, invitations to Minister Farrakhan, who has been wonderful with us. We have a very good relationship with the Nation of Islam and Minister Farrakhan, and they said they would send someone. I don't know if they did, but they at least responded. They said, when is it? We're going to see if we can send someone. Uh -huh. um, I sent letters to other people who were known to be publicly homophobic because we wanted them there. We wanted to d discuss it. And I plan, we hopefully will have one next year, and we have just some wonderful people lined up and in mind, and uh, it's going to be really <clears throat> fantastic. So what happened at the conference? At the conference, we had two days. It started on Friday, January 20th, and the keynote speaker Friday was Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh -huh. Now, how did Al Sharpton get involved, Reverend Sharpton? His daughter is, le I mean, his sister is lesbian, and he grew up with his sister, he saw how she was, how badly she was treated by both the church and the community. And he actually said he got involved in this work to challenge homophobia in African churches because he has repented. Mm. And he said that um, this is part of his, this year he has a tour of five cities that he's going to, to talk about homophobia in the black church because he knows, and we all know, that AIDS and HIV are problems in the black community. And one of the problems about dealing with it and talking about it is our religious ideas and beliefs that, that don't want to talk about human sexuality at all, especially not about homosexuality. And he said we can't get to the AIDS crisis until, until we deal with homophobia. So Reverend Sharpening gave a great, a great sermon that day, and then there was a panel discussion with uh, Reverend Ken Samuels, who's from Victory for the World Church in Atlanta. I just went to his church last week. It is an incredible uh, uh, facility. Uh -huh. And what he is just, he's a heterosexual ally who just is on board with us. I mean, that was the whole point, to get heterosexual allies. And he talked about it's very important for us not to underwrite our own oppression. And when we're in these churches where we're being, as Maxine Waters said, cussed out by the pulpit and you're just singing in the choir and leading the choir and all that. I mean, what's that all about? You are underwriting your own oppression. So we want to put a stop to that. Well, maybe this is a good time to get uh, just a flavor of some of the speeches. I know you were talking about Reverend Samuels and uh, let's listen to a little piece of what he said. For, for a desire to feed the institution and grow the membership and get the money I did not address the homophobia nor the patriarchy that was endemic to my congregation. When I began to do that, that's when all hell broke loose. When we ordained our first female deacon, we had many persons who, who, who got upset and rumbled. And as a matter of fact, I had a woman come to me and said, now, Pastor, you know this is not right because the Bible clearly says that a deacon ought to be the husband of one wife. And I said to her, well, the Bible also says that we, all of us, are the bride of Christ. So if a man can be a bride, then I guess a woman can be a deacon. <laughs> Needless to say, she left. <laughs> but that was nothing like the commotion that happened when I started, when I started challenging the homophobia of our church. And when I started raising issues about if we are a church that really believes in the whosoever will, broad invitation of Jesus, then how is it that certain people can come into church but can't come any further? How is it that we are engaged in merely tolerating people as long as they stay in their place and thereby recreating the kind of prejudice and the kind of, uh, the kind of injustice that we are trying to preach against uh, in the church. And when I did that at the Victory Church, when the people knew that people, people found out that I was serious about that, 2,500 of our good paying members walked out the door. Good tithing members, as we say, walked out of the door and said, Pastor, uh, it is obvious to us that you don't care about family, you don't care about values, you are allowing these people to come in, sitting them beside us, and we don't want our children exposed to that element. And so I had to begin to do some teaching and some dialogue and some discussion. Uh, most of those 2,500 have not come back. 
They've joined many other churches um, around the city, and they're listening to pastors who know better and who call me up late at night and say, Doc, you're a bad preacher, but I can't mess with my money and my members like that. Reverend Ken Samuel is just incredible. I mean, the man is brilliant. I'm just so glad that he's on our side. That's the kind of, that's the caliber of people that we're looking for. People who put their, their, their livelihood, in a way, on the line. I mean, Reverend Timothy McDonald stood up for us. Reverend Ken Samuel stood up for us. Reverend Lois Newton Edwards from Oklahoma City uh, came all the way and was on the panel with them to stand up for us. These are heterosexual allies who are, going, who are saying that the conservative right is undermining the black family hmm. by pushing anti-marriage laws, anti-marriage protection laws, and anti-adoption laws now that's going to be the focus of a lot of amendments this year. They are undermining the black family and this is wrong and we have to do something about it. Well, in terms of some of the intersection work, um, I guess the sort of the other side of that is uh, that the right wing has never, ever been with the African-American community on any of their issues. Uh, they've been against civil rights legislation uh, virtually for anybody. So it was really kind of a surprise to me to watch over the course of the last several years the way the right wing has sort of tried to buy off the black churches. It's surprising, it's disappointing, sometimes it's just the minister and the congregation will still vote Democratic. Uh, you can kind of see a little about that, a little of that at Coretta King's funeral right. when Bill Clinton was obviously much more, I mean, he, Bill Clinton is loved. Was George Bush loved? This is at, the, at, at Bishop Long who's basically homophobic and is, I think, I don't know if he's, I think he's part of the faith-based. Uh, movement where they get money from from the government. You know, I can't say for sure, but I think I've read that somewhere. But the sentiment, especially since Katrina, you know, Bush's ratings are percent the black community. I think we're going to see a sea change this year in the black church. I really do because of our efforts and the efforts of other people, efforts of Reverend Sharpton, and the understanding that these people who have historically been against us, been against affirmative action been against voting rights, been against everything that Coretta King and Martin Luther King stood for, are, are just trying to use this one issue to drive a wedge between black people and, and, and black families, really. Or are, are congregations and churches trying to, to be, you know, George Bush said he's a uniter, not a divider, and uh, this is all just division. Division, uh, it's, 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 most harmful things that's ever been done to the black community. I call it the cult of the purchase pulpit. I think there's always been a lot of um, denial in virtually every community about so many of these issues. Uh, and two things about that, I think, in this context. Now, first, everybody knows in the black churches there are gay people. They're the choir director, members of the choir. Uh, people admire them. Uh, people even love them. How do real people in the churches, knowing this, uh, put this together with the official voice from the pulpit of condemnation? I mean, how do they put that together? I grew up in a church where you never heard anything about homosexuality, period. There were no sermons against gay people until after Stonewall, and gay and lesbian people started coming out, coming out at church, coming out of the closet, and marching in parades where we had a higher visibility. It's then that the sermons start creeping up on you. They did focus groups of African-American older people who are called chronic voters, the voters who know they have to vote because they were denied votes uh, previously in their lives. Mm -hmm. What they found was that African-Americans don't want to vote for discrimination. They don't want to discriminate. But they feel it's okay to draw the line at marriage. And one of the problems is, and this goes to right to what you said, yeah, they know the choir director's gay but the choir director hasn't told them about their life. Mm -hmm. They know that someone's gay, but they don't know what that means. They don't know what that means in the real world about even voting against their rights of the, their own choir member or the deacon or the minister. Someone in their church is gay, someone on that pew is gay, and they feel it's okay to vote against their rights because that person in that pew has not come to them and said, this is my family, this is my lover, and this is important to me. That's where the problem lies. 
Well, I think that's one of the reasons that we started National Coming Out Day altogether, because it's, it's one of the most powerful tools that we have, letting people know who we really are. Well, we know that our personal stories really are what make uh, a difference and make an impact on people's lives. It's that person to person, the thing. To, so you see, it's, you're hurting real human beings when you vote against these things. Do you think you're doing something for the cause of Christ by discriminating against people? No, you're not doing that. You're hurting the cause of Christ by discriminating against people. So there's, this is why we have to have this education. And I'm glad you brought that up, Sheila, because the National Black Justice Coalition realizes how important this is, and that's why this year we have Blackout 2006, where we are going to every state of the union, 50 states, and ask 2,006 people from every state to come out to someone and, and, and to vote, to register to vote. So we're on the job there because we know how important that is, that personal testimony of this is who I am, this is my life, and we're asking people to not vote against us. And when I go on radio and have debates with people, you know, it's funny how it really comes down to you're just de trying to debate my humanity, and my humanity is not debatable, debatable. I think the other aspect of denial has to do with something you were talking about before in the area of uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, people in the black community thought, well, this AIDS thing, it's really not our problem, it's really a problem for gay people. And the denial kind of came in where, you know, they, it didn't take into account that there were bisexual men or that even men who were having affairs with other men but didn't think of themselves as gay. And it really allowed, I think, the whole thing to be kind of kept uh, secret. There was a lot of secrecy about it. Well, Sheila, I, that's a good point, but this is not uh, endemic or, or even pandemic to African-American people. Absolutely. We want to know that there are white men on the down low, white preachers on the down low, Asian, Latin, Native American, a lot of people are on the down low. It's just that African Americans write books about it <laughs> and then go on Oprah and everyone say, oh, you're on the down low. Cause you're, okay, what happened? Well, you have to read, I think, Keith Boykin's book, Beyond the Down Low, to really get a good understanding of what's going on there because uh, this, is, this really all comes down to the inability for churches and religion to talk about human sexuality. And when I was doing my workshops on sexuality in the black church, one minister summed it up for me. He said, you know, when you talk about, well, the Bible is black and white about sex. And when you want to talk about sex, you get into the gray area, and we can't deal with the gray. Mm -hmm. The problem is, number one, the Bible isn't black and white about sex. But number two, if you can't deal, if you can only deal in black and white, human beings live in the gray, the black white and all the rainbows of the color so what he's doing is admitting we cannot deal with the human condition as it really is and that's a problem for the black church and I, they know it's a problem and they they're trying to deal with it but they just have you know this there's they're uh, skittish about talking about sexuality they don't want to say the wrong thing I mean this is why parents and seem to not be able to talk about their own kids about human sexuality well, I think this has been an issue in religion for, uh, I mean, over the centuries. Uh, every religion um, uh, has had to talk about or not talk about sexuality. I mean, the Catholic Church, for instance, seemed to me that they, from the beginning, used sex and sexuality as a kind of a, a control device, put a lot of rules down about it as a way to control the members. Um, so it's, it's often been an, a very significant aspect of what the church has talked about or about, I guess you're saying in this case, you're either saying too much about it or you're not saying anything at all. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to get into the Catholic Church, but there are a lot of th things coming up on the cover of the Village Voice this week. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not Catholic, so I really can't speak on it, but the point is that sexuality is the church has put sex in the closet and we're talking about islam hinduism even uh maybe everyone but buddhism is has got problems with dealing with where people live and people live in their bodies they live in their human sexuality and it's really amazing i was i was in baltimore uh at the legislature legislature uh debate on the marriage 
putting uh, anti-gay marriage bills or legislation into the Constitution mm -hmm. of the state of Maryland. And I was being interviewed outside, and, and the interviewer was friendly, but they said, some people think homosexual homosexuality is unnatural. What do you think? And I want to say, that's so last century. We've known since 1869 that there's something called orientation. And uh, I'm saying 1869 because the man who invented the term, I think his name was Karl Maria Kurt Benny from an Austro-Hungarian, coined that term. And it made its way to the United States about the turn of the last century, the 1900s. So we've known for at least a century that there's something called orientation. Orientation is real. It's not, it's not something we made up because we're all heterosexual and uh, we're doing other things, so we're saying it's orientation. Orientation is inborn, innate. It's unconscious. It's not a conscious choice, and it's a gift from God. So to, say, to have someone say, is that natural or not? I mean, it's just like we've, we've, had the dis we've had that discussion, okay? There's no reason... To go, I mean, it's like saying, is being black natural in a white world? Is being white natural in a black world? Is being left-handed natural? Is having hazel eyes natural? It's just kind of, it's crazy making. Well, I think it's discrimination itself that's really not natural. I mean, it has to be generated. It has to be manipulated. You have to kind of introduce it into the culture. And you were talking about left-handed people. Um, I don't think most people know that the Latin word for left is sinister. And that entered the language as uh, meaning sneaky and having to do with left-handed people. Uh, I, I mean, I don't see how, you know, the, the word itself has entered the language meaning sneaky. Not only are left-handed people um, not seen, uh, you know, here's a, another, you talked about sinister. The other thing is in the Bible it talks about Christ sitting on the right hand of God. So the right hand of God is the blessed part. This is why my brother's left-handed. He came along at a time where people who, had left, who were left-handed had their hands tied behind their back, weren't punished for writing with the left hand. And now we know that that's an orientation, that it's innate, it's unconscious. It's not, the, the, no one's sinning by writing with their left hand. No one's sinning by falling in love with someone that they're naturally attracted to. And uh, we have to deal with, uh, I think, some uh, pretty infantile, primitive ideas about human sexuality that we have to bring people along. And it's really it's troubling that people go so far back in their um, not knowingness about basic human sexuality. Well, I think that's why people were so excited to hear about this conference being uh, organized in Atlanta. I mean, we've been just so in despair about the success of the right wing and manipulating churches uh, to be against us. And it, it looked like they were just unifying everybody. And then suddenly we read in the paper that there's this incredible conference being organized for religious people to talk about this issue. And, and you know, I kind of interrupted you actually. We were starting to talk about the conference and the way it went and the first day, the speech and the panel, and then I interrupted you, so um, will you tell us a little bit more, or a lot more, about the conference? Well, first, we had the rousing speech by Reverend Al Sharpton, and then the panel discussion, and then the afternoon we had um, more uh, sessions by some of our uh, prominent uh, speakers, but the next day, the roof was blown off the church with Bishop Yvette Flunder. She was incredible. Uh, I, I, I just, you know, I'm not a person. I was raised Seventh-day Adventist, so we were trained not to show any emotion in church. You can't <laughs> clap. You don't dance ever. You know, they even think that sex leads to dancing. That's, <laughs> you know, that's how they're afraid they are of movement. Uh -huh. And so this was, a, we had a Pentecostal <laughs> Holy Ghost uh, it was incredible with Bishop Yvette Flunder. And this is a woman, I wrote her and I said, you are someone who is at the height of their intellectual and spiritual powers. And we really felt it that day. I'm getting chills right now. Well, how about if we share it with the audience and, and show them just a little piece of what her remarks were like. Okay. Keep on singing in the choir. Keep on taking those peripheral jobs that they think are harmless like the usher on the usher board. Surviving in the church world. Some pretending just to keep their careers, keep their income, keep their prestige, keep their congregations. 
And I can tell you some stories. I've been singing gospel music for longer than some of you have lived. And in that experience, I can tell you, and I'll say it categorically, if it were not for the contributions of same gender loving people, there would be no gospel music. But yet, the preacher will sing a song written by a same gender loving person. And then in the next breath, beat that person's personhood into powder. A culture of lying, which breeds a culture of self-loathing, which skews our sense of self. And we're not really sure altogether who we are at times and what our purpose is in the earth because it's been defined by those things that are external to us and not internal. And some remain silent and used because our gifts are disproportionately represented. We are music. We are dance. We are Alvin Ailey. We are beauty. We are hair and nails and design. The world would be navy blue without us. We are the shamans. We are the ones not limited. We see the beauty in men and women. We are, we are prophetic. And we are needed. And we feel needed, but rejected simultaneously. Yvette Flunder, I mean, I just, you know, I just, she's, she's just incredible. Just incredible. So talented. And uh, I, I, now, tell us a little bit more about her. I mean, everybody watching this doesn't have a program in front of them to know exactly who she is. Bishop Yvette Flunder is the pastor of the City of Refuge Ministries in San Francisco, but they're branching out. They're opening up one in Washington, D.C. Now, uh, Bishop Yvette Flunder, I'm just getting to know her because I just found out. She right now is in Zimbabwe overseeing an orphanage that she has founded. This woman is like... Uh, Oprah Winfrey, in a way, that she just, and I talked to her brother, and he said, you know, she was always for the underdog as a kid, and I knew she was bound for greatness. And you can see it in that clip that she is just, she touched our hearts, and we were just so filled that day. And we know this is a spiritual movement. That's the thing. This has been the problem with uh, the gay community in the past, and this is what's changed, and that's why I think there will be a change. In the past, we have used secular tools to fight religious wars. Now we're using religious tools to fight religious wars. And that's the change. And the religious right doesn't know we're doing this yet, but they're going to know. Well, it certainly seems apparent in this gathering. Uh, what was the response, uh, as you saw it in your opinion, uh, of the people who got to attend this conference? We got feedback that it was such a life-changing experience for them. One of our ministers, uh, Reverend Donna Allen was on the plane flying back to Los Angeles and she said uh, she was sitting next on the plane sitting next to a man a stranger who said uh, where have you been she said I've been to this conference in Atlanta and she was telling him about the conference and he said well I don't believe in that I think it's wrong she said well pull out your Bible and they had Bible study on the plane and by the end of that plane ride he said please let's keep in touch let's keep talking wow. he was changed we had another minister, I mentioned her before, Reverend Lois Newton Edwards, a heterosexual ally from Oklahoma City, who wrote me and said, I have, ch I'm quitting my ministry to do this full time. Wow. I'm going to work with my lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered brothers and sisters to work on this full time. I am so inspired. We had a man who had come because uh, he was the manager of one of the singers who sang. A heterosexual who had no idea what the the um, summit was about he wrote me and he said you know I didn't agree with you before this but now I agree with 99 percent of what you're talking about because I've heard you explain it and this will influence my vote in the future Wow I mean it was a life-changing event so how does the black uh, National Black Justice Coalition carry this work uh, into the broader community, uh, into the country, uh, l let's say in the next year. Right, in the next year, I'm glad you asked, because at that summit we did form the Black Church Social Justice Community Action Network. 
And what we're going to do is have uh, the religious right has something called Justice Sunday, but when you look at what the program is about, they should call it Injustice Sunday. So we're going to have a program on June 18th in honor of Juneteenth, which is for people who don't know, that's we say Juneteenth for African Americans. That's sort of when slavery was abolished. It wasn't a particular day, but it was sometime in June after the Civil War. You know, when right after, you know, I mean, the truth is Lincoln didn't free slaves in slave states. So when slaves did get free, especially in Texas, because it's a big, mm -hmm. um, you know, event in Texas. So in honor of Juneteenth, Pride Month, and because June is a uh, black music celebration month. Mm -hmm. And who has fueled the energy of the church but gospel music, and who does gospel music better than black gay people? I mean, you know, I mean, come on. Uh -huh. So this is going to be an opportunity. It's called A Call to Justice. It's June 18th, and it will be June 17th because we're asking synagogues to join us too, and Seventh-day Adventist churches. So it'll be a, a call to justice that weekend for ministers to either preach a pro-gay sermon or to have for there, be, there to be a Sunday school or Sabbath school or afternoon program to talk about the contribution, contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people to the faith community. Or they can have something in the bulletin about how um, famous black gay gospel artists have influenced the church. Whatever, we, you know, they can be creative, but as long as they do something that acknowledges African American people of faith and, and everyone, um, gay and lesbian people of faith, who've, who've done so much for the church. Where would the Christian church be today without the Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus? That was Handel, he was gay. Where would the church be today without the Sistine Chapel, the, the um, Da Vinci's uh, Last Supper, without the statue of David? Those are two gay men, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Where, I mean, I, you know, I could go for two years on that with what gay and lesbian people have done for the Christian church, part of its foundation, part of its energy, and part of its, part of its future. It's gonna be interesting to see how this all works out. Uh, do you think the people in the churches and synagogues uh, celebrating gay and lesbian people on, on this day will make the connection with the way the right wing has really uh, corrupted religion on this matter? I think they will, especially if they follow Reverend Al Sharpton's uh, lead when he at the summit talked about how these Christian conservatives and, and the Republican Party, he said they couldn't come to the black church to talk about the war. They couldn't come to the black church to talk about the economy. They couldn't come to the black church to talk about um, Iraq. They couldn't come to the black church to talk about Katrina. They couldn't talk about the deficit. They couldn't talk about jobs. What they could talk about is how we all band together to not like gay people and use it as a wedge issue. Well, I think it's really wonderful for people to think, hey, I, I've been used and I don't want to be used anymore. It's almost like a, a kind of a waking up of people saying, uh, you know, I just will not be used in this way anymore. Even Reverend Jesse Jackson has been doing that in, um, in campaigns last year. He said, well, how many of you know anyone who are gay and lesbian are going to get married this year? No one raised their hand. Well, how many of you know? And he's talked about why is marriage, gay marriage, seen as such an issue in the black community for you to actually go out of your way to, to inscribe in discrimination against the law if it's not a part of your personal life. And he, he and uh, oh, a lot of ministers, including Michael Eric Dyson, a Baptist minister who's going to be working with us, and Cornell West from Princeton University, Reverend James Forbes, they're always, tr always trying to make them connect the dots, the, the, the connect the dots of oppression. The people who are consistently racist have also been sexist and homophobic too. The people who have been consistently racist have hated you can't you see that? It's time to open your eyes and see it. So what is your work going to be this coming year? I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I have to get a national justice, a call to justice uh, sermon um, event going. I have to do constituency development. We're working on, in addition to working with people of faith, we're working on um, bringing people in who want to be, to teach them to be either candidates or to run um, 
Yes, we're having that in June also. We're having it where we've um, working with the Victory Fund to train African American people to run for office or to be campaign managers. I'm working on that. Also, uh, the call to justice won't be the only thing we're doing. We are the, another main um, program with the Department of Religious Affairs with the National Black Justice Coalition is to, we've picked 10 states to work in. And there, it's on a three-tier basis. Things are really heating up in Colorado, Maryland, and we're doing work in Florida. Those are our top three states. And then we're, there are seven more states we're gonna work in. What we're gonna do is organize in these states town hall meetings where we'll bring in people to talk about issues of marriage protections and challenging homophobia in the black church. And then we'll have a follow-up workshop and we're gonna use materials and give them tools to do this. We're gonna show them how to do it. And we want the discussion to be on the table and we don't want to be just preaching to the choir. We want to invite the ministers who don't like us. We want to invite the congregants who don't know. You know, in any political movement, even Barney Frank talked about, there are some people who wouldn't vote for him if the voting, voting booth were on fire, okay? That's like about a third of Americans. Those third can stay where they are fine, okay? And then there's about a third who are on our side, who love us, who want to work with us. That's the people we're working with because we're going to the movable middle. And we're going to say to the movable middle, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, as Martin Luther King said. And that we are calling you. That's why we're called the National Black Justice Coalition. Mm -hmm. we're, it's a justice movement. It's a spiritual movement. And we feel that discrimination anywhere is wrong. We think it's immoral. And we think the people who are doing it are wrong and immoral. And we're going to be in your face and let you know that. So we want the movable middle to move towards justice. Well, I just wish there were a whole lot more of you. And actually, I guess seeing this gathering in Atlanta, we could say maybe there are a whole lot more of you. Um, I think people would also like to know more about uh, the other work of the National Black Justice Coalition. What, uh, aside from the area of uh, religion and religious, uh, what is the coalition working on? The coalition has a communications director, Ray Daniels, who um, takes care of uh, not just communications, but we we have a magazine that we uh, publish, and um, we're working on the second issue right now. We sent out the first issue, and it was incredibly well received because it's really done with a lot of substance and professionalism, and we're very proud of it. Uh, he does the website. Oh, oh, I'll tell you one thing we did this month was really great. Every single day we're highlighting an African-American gay and lesbian person. And we're, we're, people are writing and saying, I never knew. I mean, we have Benjamin <laughs> Banneker, George Washington Carver, uh -huh. uh, you know, Hattie McDaniel, everyone. <laughs> uh, and a lot of them are bisexual. So, uh -huh. it's, you know, because we're lesbian, gay, and bisexual and transgendered. Right. But it's like, it's, a, it's a, been a history lesson every day, and people are writing and saying, this is so wonderful. So we're going to make a big poster of it so people can have it and refer to it, because it's very inspiring. We're also, um, I'm trying to think of some other things that Ray does. Oh, yeah, we, the, um, we, we're with the Black Pride, so we'll be with uh -huh, Black Prides. Sure. And that's like almost, that's, that's at least six months out of the year, going to the Black Prides and uh, working on voter registration, but we also work hand in hand with the NAACP, with the Congressional Black Caucus, with the Urban League. We have relationships with them. The NAACP, the head of the NAACP in California, Alice Huffman, stood up for us against all odds and is with us 100% of the way, and we're so proud of her. She's a real hero, and the Urban League is on our side. We're going to start maybe doing more with uh, Reverend Lawry of the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference because he did an amazing sermon that was pro-gay at Howard University mm -hmm. that just blew the roof off. He's just incredible. And you saw how great he was at, uh, or some saw how great he was at Coretta King's funeral. Right. And it's just, they're, they're out there. We're going to get them into the fold and, and you'll hear from us some more. You know, we were so stunned, uh, in the good sense of the word, stunned and amazed at Alice Huffman. Uh, coming to the legislature to testify on behalf of marriage equality. And she testified in front of a number of committees that I was on. I got to hear her remarks, not just once. She came back. She spent so much time with us, really working on the marriage equality legislation, which passed our legislature. 
And it was so wonderful to see the California NAACP put this kind of energy into it. And she was talking about the connections between kinds of oppression and how similar they were and why it was very important for us to all show up for each other. Alice Huffman is amazing. She's one of my heroes and she's just a wonderful person. Um, she, she, she gets it, you know, she, gets, she's, she connects the dots. And it's not just the California NAACP. When I was in Maryland testifying, the head of the Maryland NAACP was there for us to talk about discrimination, how the Maryland NAACP stands with us against discrimination and, and inscribing discrimination into the uh, Maryland Constitution. And also Julian Bond, my goodness, what an incredible man. He spoke at the Human Rights Campaign and gave one of the most seminal speeches on gay and lesbian rights ever given. He was just, we, he just riveted the audience. He was amazing. So they're there, and there's more of them, and there's going to be more of them. So that movable middle is on notice. You are going to be given some information. They can do what they want with it, but you've been given the truth. You've been told about justice and injustice and how injustice hurts, and it's immoral, it's unkind, it's un unfair, it's unjust, it's unwarranted, and that we're fighting, we're standing up for justice and equal rights. And that's a moral crusade. You know, Sylvia, we've known each other a long time, and I've watched your work over a number of years. So I want to ask you in the it's kind of a more personal vein, um, how you feel about this work now, how this experience uh, is changing you or has changed you, and if you feel differently now than you have before. I mean, it's been, you, you were toiling not in obscurity, but certainly there wasn't a whole lot of support for this work early on, and it's been a steep hill to climb. So how are you feeling now about it? Is it any different than it was in the past? I think that, uh, well, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested. I really, you know, we all go through our yeah. own journeys. I think this is really a seminal change for me to move from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., to do this work on a national basis, and to see that people can be touched. Their hearts can be touched. Their minds can be changed. So it really helps me wake up every morning with a lot of energy to do the work. Um, I actually kind of am a workaholic. I work on the weekends. I worked every day from Christmas past New Year's. The letter I wrote to Bishop Eddie Long and to Bernice was on New Year's Day. Um, you know, I said, this is the first day of a new year. Let's, Good way let's to start let, the year. Yeah, let's start the new year off. Sure. And I was at work during those times because I really like coming to work because I think we can change the world. I think what, what better reason to get up than to know here's another day I'm going to have an opportunity to actually change the world. So things are different for me in that it's more... Uh, it's national, it's more intense. Yeah, it's not really just national, it's international too, because the National Black Justice Coalition is on its way to Montreal for the cultural, uh, the, they're gonna be gay games, but they're having a cultural fair, an international cultural fair, and we're presenting on the state, uh, well, strategies to diminish homophobia in African American uh, communities in the United States of America. So it's sort of international too, because what we know, Sheila, is that other countries look at American, the American uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered movement, and we either inspire them or we are an object lesson for them. But they look to us for leadership because we are the United States. We're supposed to be the greatest power in the world and the beacon for democracy. And when we're, when we're getting beaten and kicked up in the greatest democracy of the world and how we respond to that with the kind of integrity that we have and, and the, the incredible moral force that we have, it's inspirational internationally. Would you say you're feeling more hope now than you've felt in a long time? I'm feeling more hope now, yes, because it, it just going to the summit, see the energy that was there and the people who want to see change and people who know that the forces behind our, our opponents are malevolent. We're fighting malevolent forces. And so they want to do something good and they want to work hard at it and they want to put their, put the, you know, they want to be out there and be seen. So I'm seeing, uh, like I said, a sea change. I'm seeing movement. I'm seeing encouragement. I'm happy about it. Well, you need to to kind of keep up your own energy. So do you have colleagues in this work that are feeling really the same about it around the country? Uh, people feeling hopeful? Yeah, I think there's an energy out there that people are feeling that there's going to be a change and that 
where we, we know we can do it because telling our personal stories, telling the truth about our, ourselves. You know, our, our movement is built on truth. And even you said something, I think, about we've never lost a civil rights movement in the United States. This is a civil rights movement. We're not going to lose this. And they know it. That's why they're fighting so hard because they also know it's a generational thing because they know their kids are not as racist and homophobic as they were as kids and that they're losing and they're going to lose. And we'll have a big party that day and a celebration and a cake and we'll say, we won. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's kind of faith in America, really, isn't it? I mean, that's another place where you might say there's a dichotomy. Uh, people in the country who are uh, worried or thinking, well, we've just headed completely down the other way. It's every man for himself. Uh, nobody cares about these things anymore. And then other people who say, no, 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 America is still holding to its dream, holding to its principles, and this is what we need to do. That's right. You know, I mean, even our founding fathers said that this is a never-ending struggle for freedom and that it has to be fought over and over again. But we're not going to have, I mean, you know, African Americans are no longer being lynched like we were and we're not enslaved. We've come a long way. Afri uh, gay and lesbian people aren't going through some of the problems they may have gone in the 60s and 70s, although we really have a long way to go, but we're going to get there. And we're going to get there with time on our side, with history on our side, with love on our side, with justice on our side. Uh, we can't lose. Well, thank you, Dr. Sylvia Rue, for being with us today and for sharing all of those experiences. And as for the rest of you, there's justice, a building in America, so just get used to it.